Hey everyone, hope you all are doing well. In today's video, we are going to dive deep into the pharmaceutical industry in India with the objective of understanding the domestic and international trade dynamics, the challenges that the Indian pharma industry is facing, the key factors that can drive growth in the industry, and lastly, why I feel that Cipla Limited, which is the second largest pharma player in India, has the potential for massive growth in the coming semi-decade. Keep in mind that this video is not at all an investment recommendation, and so you should do your own research before making any investment decision. In case you are new here, then do consider supporting this channel by smashing that subscribe button. Now, to be able to understand this video better, it's important that you know the difference between innovative medicine, generic drugs, branded generics, and trade generics. So starting with innovative medicine, it's basically a patent protected drug that is made by using specific active pharmaceutical ingredients and is first to receive approval for use by agencies such as US FDA, EMA or any other national regulatory body. The patent on these innovative medicines lasts for 20 years, which is enough for pharmaceutical companies to recoup the R&D cost that went into developing them. Now, when 20 years elapsed, the patent on the innovative medicine expires and then other pharmaceutical companies are legally allowed to produce the exact copy of the innovative medicine by using the same active pharmaceutical ingredient and thereafter sell it freely in the market. These copies of the innovative medicine are called generic drugs and they are typically sold under their chemical name. Now, what's special about them is that they're not only 50 to 90% cheaper than the innovative medicine, but they're also bioequivalent, which means they work the same way in the body as the innovative medicine. Now comes the interesting part. Pharma companies actually don't like selling generic drugs. Can you guess why? Well, let me explain. See, if multiple companies make the same generic drug under the same chemical name, it would become difficult for them to market their specific drug. And then the winner in the market would always be the pharma player that sells the drug for the cheapest. To avoid such a scenario, branded generics came into the picture. So branded generics are actually the same generic drugs, but what makes them different is that instead of being sold under its chemical name, they are sold under a brand name that is created by pharma companies. This helps the pharma players to charge a premium price for their branded generic because the company's brand value gets added to the generic drug and the added advantage is that they are able to ensure that the benefits of their marketing efforts are reaped by them solely. Now, the next question that should come to your mind is what are trade generics then? Well, both branded generics and trade generics are actually the same. The difference just lies in the way they are marketed. See, companies market branded generics to specific targets such as healthcare providers and patient population, while trade generics are sold directly to retailers and distributors. Though it's much more expensive to go the branded generic route, it is what gives the most results because in India, we know that most drugs are prescribed by doctors rather than chemists. From the perspective of margins, the average margin on branded generics is between 8 to 20%, whereas the same on trade generics is between 50 to 70%. Now that you understand the difference between innovative medicine, generic drugs, branded generics, and trade generics, let's now take an overview of the pharmaceutical industry in India. See, currently the pharma industry in India is valued at $58 billion and is projected to reach $130 billion by 2030. For those of you who don't know, India is also called the pharmacy of the world. This global recognition has been possible mainly because of cost-efficient R&D, low labor costs, and large-scale manufacturing of formulations by pharma players in India. If we were to look at the segregation of India's pharmaceutical industry, then clearly branded generics dominate the market by a whopping 87% market share. In terms of international trade, India exports pharmaceutical products to 200 plus countries worldwide, but there is one country that has disproportionately high share in India's exports. It is none other than the US. To give you a clear picture, out of the total $27.82 billion of pharma exports, close to 31% went to the US. No wonder why India has the highest number of US FDA compliant pharma plants outside of the US. Now, if you look at the distribution side, then 85% of the pharma products distribution in India happens through standalone pharmacies and institutional supplies. The contribution of e-pharmacies is quite less in the retail pharmacy ecosystem, but the popularity of e-pharmacies such as 1MG, PharmEasy, NetMeds is on the rise, and it is projected that the e-pharmacy market size will reach 8,940 crores by 2027. Now pay close attention as I'm going to introduce two new terms to you. The first term is bulk drugs or active pharmaceutical ingredients, which is basically the core chemical ingredient in a medicine that helps to treat a disease. And the second term is formulation, which is the final form factor of the medicine, such as
such as syrup, capsule, tablet, or injection. Basically, the formulation is made by combining the bulk drug or API with other substances that help with the stability of the core chemical, its better absorption in the body, and a satisfactory taste. On your screen right now is the data about the key therapy areas in India's formulation market. Clearly, the largest market share is held by cardiovascular, that is heart-related diseases, followed by anti-infectives that aid in treating infections from bacteria, virus, fungus, and parasites. The fastest growing therapy area though is anti-diabetic with a CAGR growth of 13 to 14%. Moving on, let's now take a look at two of the biggest challenges that prevail for India's pharmaceutical industry. See, first of all, there is huge over-dependence on China for bulk drugs. It might sound crazy, but more than 70% of bulk drugs or API in India are actually imported from China. This makes Indian pharma players so susceptible to disruptions in supply chain as well as foreign currency risks. Secondly, there is always a pricing pressure that looms over Indian pharma players. There are two reasons for this. The first is that Indian pharma players don't have much room to negotiate the price of their products. You may think, why is that? Well, it's because 90% of the pharmaceutical wholesale market in the US is actually controlled by just three companies, Amerisource Virgin, Cardinal Health and McKesson Corporation. And in order to be distributed well in the US, Indian pharma players have no choice but to export their formulations to these three wholesalers. The second reason for pricing pressure is that more number of pharma companies from different countries have started to get ANDA approvals from US FDA and this has increased the competition significantly, thereby leading to a sharp erosion in the price of drugs. For those of you who don't know, ANDA stands for Abbreviated New Drug Application. Now, despite these challenges, I believe that the future prospects of the Indian pharmaceutical industry still look looks bright. Let's look at five key factors that will drive growth in the Indian pharmaceutical industry. The first is an increase in life expectancy due to improved access to healthcare services. By 2036, more than 15% of the population will be in the 60 plus years age group. Since chronic illnesses become more common with age, this rise in aging population will definitely increase the demand for pharma products. The second factor is the number of products going off patent in the US. As you can see on your screen, between 2024 and 2026, more than 1200 products are going off patent in the US. This presents a huge opportunity for pharma companies in India to develop generic versions of the drugs while ensuring reduced time between the drug's development and its commercialization. Thirdly, the per capita expenditure on health in India is amongst the lowest among developing countries. But this scenario is changing with improvements in health insurance penetration in India. India's health insurance market is growing at a CAGR of 12.8% and is expected to reach $23.8 billion by 2028. At the same time, the government-sponsored health insurance that is Ayushman Bharat PMJY covers close to 10.74 crore families with a healthcare assurance of Rs 5 lakh yearly. The increasing health insurance penetration in the coming years would definitely increase the demand for pharma products in India. The fourth key factor that will drive growth for the pharmaceutical industry is the government's initiative to promote medical tourism in India. In the FY25 budget, Nirmala Sitaraman announced that the government will partner with private healthcare providers to promote medical tourism in India. When compared to developed nations, healthcare services are quite affordable in India and that's the reason why close to 7.3 million medical tourists visited India in 2024. As per estimates, this number will continue to grow by 20% year on year. Last but not the least, the generics market is experiencing strong growth in developed nations such as the US, UK, Belgium, France, and Germany. At the same time, to tackle the pricing pressure and make better margins, Indian pharma players have started to focus on complex generics as well as synthesis of APIs. In layman terms, complex generics are pharma products that have a complex active ingredient, a complex formulation, or a complex drug device combination. API synthesis, on the other hand, is a complicated and multi-step process of making the main chemical component of a medicine that actually works to treat the disease. Moving on, now that you have become well acquainted with the dynamic of the pharmaceutical industry in India, let's dive deep into the business of Cipla Limited and try to decipher its future based on some important financial metrics. So Cipla was established in 1935 and is currently the second largest pharmaceutical company in India and the third largest pharmaceutical company in South Africa's private market. It has over 46 CGMP compliant manufacturing facilities across five countries. For those of you who don't know, CGMP stands for Current Good Manufacturing Practices, which basically ensures high standards of quality control and production processes that enable safe 
and reliable products. Through these facilities, CIPLA has been able to build an enormous formulation capacity to serve multiple geographies globally. It generates 43% of the revenue from India, 30% from North America, 12% from South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, and the remaining 15% from emerging markets and Europe. CIPLA believes that scientific innovation is the foundation and core of its business structure, and so it has a skilled in-house team of 1,700 plus professionals that drive its R&D efforts. In FY24, the company's R&D expenditure was 1,571 crores, and if you were to see the past trend, then this number is increasing by approximately 17% year on year. As of 31st March 2024, CIPLA had 298 granted patents, and it launched 101 new products in FY24. At the moment, CIPLA's portfolio of 1,500 plus products spans across 65 therapeutic categories. It is a leader in respiratory therapy with a market share of 25% in India. In the respiratory therapy area, CIPLA also focuses on medical devices that complement and solidify its leadership position. At the same time, it has a stronghold in oncology therapy in North America with a market share of 21%. Some of CIPLA's products such as Omnigel, Foracort and Cipladine are ranked the number one brand in their category in India. There are other key brands of CIPLA as well, but the brands that saw really high growth in FY24 are as follows. It is quite clear from this that CIPLA has a stronghold in categories such as asthma management, pain recovery, nicotine replacement therapy, cuff and cold, and oral rehydration salts. Currently, antimicrobial resistance, particularly in gram-negative bacteria, is one of the biggest threats to global health. CIPLA is building a strong portfolio of antibacterial drugs to combat this threat and enhance its access in India. Furthermore, CIPLA's Strategic Vision 2028 focuses on creating a portfolio of products related to obesity, central nervous system, and oncology. By the way, if you see the top therapy areas in 2028 in terms of global spending, then obesity and oncology lead the charts. If you were to see their market size, then by 2033, the obesity market is expected to be around $125 billion, and the oncology market is expected to be around $521 billion. CIPLA plans to establish a stronghold in both these therapy areas by introducing semaglutide in India for obesity management and simultaneously making constant efforts to strengthen its oncology portfolio. CIPLA also believes that Medical science would only grow with collaborative efforts, and so it actively partners with global giants to come up with newer drugs with higher efficacy. For anti-diabetes medication, CIPLA has partnered with Switzerland-based Novartis and US-based Eli Lilly, and for oncology treatment, it has partnered with Roche, which is again US-based. In terms of acquisitions, CIPLA has acquired Acta Pharma, which already has established consumer brands in South Africa, and it has also acquired the brand Astaberry from Evia Beauty Private Limited to enter in the beauty and personal care category. Now looking into the future of pharma, CIPLA has identified that biosimilars, CAR-T therapy and mRNA-based therapeutics are going to play a key role in the next generation of medical advancements. Let me explain all three of them quickly to you. See, biosimilars are basically like generic versions of complex biological drugs that are made using living cells. Since living cells can't be copied, biosimilars are exactly like the complex biological medicines, but a lot cheaper, making them affordable and accessible. CIPLA has already launched its first biosimilar Adalimumab in Australia, which is useful for arthritis patients experiencing joint inflammation. Coming to CAR-T therapy, it is a special cancer treatment wherein doctors take some of the affected body's immune cells called T cells and they modify these T cells in a lab to enable them to identify and attack cancer cells better. Post modification of these T cells in the lab, they are put back into the affected body for treatment. Lastly, mRNA or messenger RNA is like a tiny instruction manual in your body that tells your cells how to make proteins, which are essential building blocks for everything in human body. The messenger RNA-based therapeutics holds great promises for applications such as protein replacement therapy, as well as cancer immunotherapy. CIPLA is investing heavily in biosimilars, CAR-T therapy, and mRNA-based therapeutics to create a large-scale impact in the future. Now moving on, let's head to the last segment of this video where we analyze the financials of CIPLA Limited using financial ratios. Firstly, if you look at the revenue of CIPLA, then there has been a consistent growth of 10% CAGR in the last five years. This is quite impressive because it tells us about the stickiness of the customers towards the company's products at such massive scale of operations. Also, the company has been actively optimizing its cost structure, which is evident from the EBITDA margins, which are significantly improved in the 
last five years. Coming to the valuation aspect, if we look at the P ratio of the company as of 8th March 2025, then Cipla is available below its median P of 29.6. Also compared to other pharma players as well, the way the company is investing in newer models such as CAR-T therapy, mRNA or biosimilars, the market for which will be huge in the future, one would most likely witness a rise in the median P going forward. In terms of return on equity as well, in the years FI 18 to 20, it was stuck in the range of 10%. But as you can see in the years post that, the return on equity has improvised a lot. This can be majorly attributed to two factors. The first is the company's conscious choice of getting rid of debt, which can be clearly seen in the company's balance sheet. And the second is the increment in return on invested capital, which it has done by optimizing its cost structure and operations. Now for a pharma company, the investment in R&D plays a key role in future success because that would ultimately lead to new drugs being developed and approved for sale. While we've already seen in the earlier part of this video that the company has consistently increased its R&D expenditure in absolute terms, a better way to look at it would be as a percentage of sales. So clearly, as you can see on your screen, there was a dip in the R&D spend in FY21, which was obviously due to the pandemic, but the company has again started to revamp its R&D spend FY22 onwards. Lastly, I believe that corrections in the stock price of such stable and fundamentally strong companies present a good buying opportunity for investors. At the moment, Cipla share price has fallen by more than 10% from its peak and buying at this level significantly increases the potential of making 14% plus CAGR returns in this stock in the coming 3-5 to five years. So there it is, I hope you have understood the nuances of the pharma industry in India and you are now better prepared to analyze other pharma players as well using the blueprint that we have used in this video. Don't forget to consult with your financial advisor to evaluate whether investing in the pharma industry aligns with your risk profile and returns expectation. Thank you so much for watching, like the video, hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for my next video.